Hey YouTubers and subscribers and Speedmaster fans, welcome back to my Speedmaster Saga. In this video, we're going to be discussing riding two up or riding doubles. If you're British, I guess your girl is riding pillion. If you're a Harley rider, I guess your girl is riding bitch. So we're going to be going over the characteristics of taking a passenger on the back of your bike. And one of my goals in this video is to eliminate the generalization that I see on some of these YouTube videos that are already out there. So we're going to be talking about the different style bike for passenger riding. We're going to be talking about the pillion experiences for passenger riding. And we're going to be talking about the piling differences for passenger riding. There's stuff in here specifically for the Speedmaster fans. We're going to answer the pillion question. So I I decided to make this video because of some of the frustrations I encountered when I was trying to research the Speedmaster and the Pillion. I didn't find a whole lot of information on that. I actually found close to very little information on the Speedmaster Pillion seats. But I did find a lot of information about riding two up, riding doubles. A lot of the information that I saw, which was supposed to be instructional, I found to be questionable, impractical, and sometimes flat out ridiculous. So anyway, I wanted to share my perspective with you and let you make your own determination. So there's a lot of stuff to go over. Um, so with that, let's get started. Okay, a quick little background before we get started. So I've been riding since 1985, since before I got my driver's license. In my lifetime of riding, I have taken a boatload of girls on the back of my bike. Short girls, tall girls, light girls, plump girls, younger girls, older girls. I guess you can call them women. I've taken them on flat surfaces. I've taken them on mountainous terrains. I've taken them in city environments. I've taken them out in good weather, bad weather, and maybe stupidly off-road uh, several times. So I had my experiences dealing with pillions um, on the back. But again, just a foot stomp one last time. The majority, with exception of four, all of them have been on the back of sports bikes. Okay, so let's talk about the different kind of bikes for riding two up. Because one of the things that generally aggravated me when I was watching these videos was how these videos generalize that this is the proper technique for all occasions, all riders, all pilots, and it's just flat out nonsense. So I didn't think we'd have to do this, but let's get into the different style bikes and their passenger seat. I think I'm going to use the airline analogy where passenger comfort is tied to the class of the seat. We'll break our classification levels into economy class, economy plus, a business class, kind of closer to first class, but we'll just call it business class, and then we'll have like a first class. So starting at the bottom, we have the super sport experience. This economy class experience is arguably the most brutal experience for a passenger. It's okay for a short flight, but for long durations, it becomes very uncomfortable very quickly. Super sport pillion seats are normally generally pretty small. They tend to be a little bit harder. The seat is rarely cushioned. Sometimes they use some kind of a polymer plastic. They sit high up and they're kind of tilted forward, which forces the passenger to kind of lean forward. And because it's a super sport, most likely it's got some kind of stiff linear spring. So the suspension is going to be uh, rigid. They're going to feel it on their ass. It's not a great experience. Here is Madison giving a description on her experience on the back of a Honda 600 CBR. You know, what was your experience on back of that bike? Mm, it's fun, a little bit scary, but it's also really uncomfortable because my like my butt bones are like sitting on there and it's not much padding. And also like when he stops, I move forward. And so I'm trying to squeeze my legs together so I don't slam into him. So it's also okay, thinking did you, did you on do the mind. helmet slam a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. The whole time it's just like. And then I feel bad when I'm like up against him because you know he's controlling my life right now, and then I don't want to slam into him, so I'm squeezing my legs as hard as I can to stay back, and then my butt bones are rubbing, and then I have like bruises on them the next day. Oh geez, that, that that's that is far worse than I thought it was going to be. Okay. <laughs> Now, to be fair, that Honda CBR that she was on was an RR. It's, it was a race-ready bike. Those things are not known for a pillion comfort. That's not what they were designed for. I mean, it's on there as a worst-case scenario. It's almost like an emergency. It's almost like a, one of those smaller spare tires you put on a car in case of emergency. You know, it's not meant for long-term riding. That is not a pillion seat that was built for comfort. It's to get somebody from point A to point B. Uh, you see how short Madison is. If this were a taller person, they'd be screwed. I mean, their legs would be just like cramped up into this tiny little triangle. Awful. Then continuing with analogy, we have Economy Plus. This is slightly better than the Super Sports. This would include your sport touring bikes, your cafe racers, your standards that are out there, um, some cruisers. Oh, oh, oh. Holy shiatsu massage! <laughs> Economy Plus! The way I'm differentiating between the class levels between economy and business is basically having a backrest. They might have a comfortable seat in the back that the girl is still hanging on, wrapped around. If you give it gas, they're still going to wrap around you. So that's economy plus. It's basically the same seating position or close to the Super Sport, but it has a much more comfortable seat. The pillion seat's designed to actually you know, be somewhat soft on the ass, if you will. So then we have business class. I'm putting any bike with a pillion seat and a backrest into that class. With this backrest, it gives them the security that they're not going to fall off the back. 
And finally, we have the first class luxury experience. Those would be, you've seen them, those big tours that are out there, the gold wings, the ones with the contoured pillion seats. Some of them have armrests. They're all leather decked out. I mean, they look more comfortable than my lazy boy in my living room. I think some of them have their own little speaker system now. They're heated back there. So I think we can all agree that that is probably the top of the line experience for the passenger. It's not going to get any better than that. I might speculate on the characteristics of the bigger bikes. For the most part, I'm going to stick with what I actually know, what I've actually experienced firsthand. So let's take a deeper dive into the pillion or passenger experience on a sport bike. We already stated that it was the least comfortable, but there are advantages to actually putting a girl on the back of a sport bike over other bikes. First is the passenger visibility. So if you have an average rider, average male rider in the front, average female rider in the back, they're gonna be normally up higher. Almost all the sports bikes are tilted with a seat up raised higher, so the girl can actually look over one of your shoulders. So that's nice. Me, personally, I found because of my size, that if the girl is five foot three or below, she's not gonna have an easy time looking over my shoulder. As a matter of fact, a lot of times I feel them actually just leaning their heads or helmets into my back as I'm driving. Kind of a little bit of laziness, a little bit of resting. The second benefit to having a pillion on the back of a sports bike, but assuming they're a normal sized girl and it's a normal sized guy in front, you still have the benefits of the aerodynamics. Yeah, it's not quite the same as the driver or the pilot tucked into the motorcycle, but it's pretty close. Compared to other bikes, I think you're gonna find the aerodynamics, even riding tandem on a sport bike, is gonna be better than on a cruiser and some of these other bikes. Because the rider's tilted forward and the girl is tilted forward and the fairing comes along, the wind kind of flows around them and closes around the back, so it does well from an aerodynamics perspective. And if it's a cold day, obviously, there's a little bit more body warmth that happens when the girl's wrapped around you. So another advantage to having a girl on the back of a sports bike is it's an easier learning curve. There's less instructions necessary, especially if it's something as simple as wrap me around the waist and just hang on, lean with me, don't lean against me, do what I do. It's a lot easier if they're wrapped around you. The sports bikes that I had ridden in the past were street sports or sports tours, so the seats were far more comfortable. So I never got complaints like the ones I heard from Madison. Uh, putting a girl back on a sports tour uh, or a street sport or something that's more comfortable will make a world of difference for her. I mean, really, check out the super sports and the hard plastic seats. It's ugly. A lot of negative characteristics still apply, like the fear of falling off, which is why they're hanging on. And not only are they cramped, but again, depending on the actual driver, um, there might be a, little, a lot of head knocking if the driver's not a smooth shifter or breaker. All right, so now let's talk about the advantages for the passengers' pillions on the Speedmaster and other similar cruisers. So as I mentioned earlier, I think the biggest jump for the Speedmaster is not the pillion seat itself, but the backrest. This combination together. You eliminate the backrest, I think it becomes a whole different experience. It has everything to do with the elimination of fear for the female of flipping off the back of the bike. It allows her to sit back. It's a far more comfortable experience. Now, true, they don't have the plush lazy boy feeling that some of these big tours do, but I think it gets the job done. They don't have to be tilted forward. They can be leaned back. They have their hands free to move around. As for the wind drag, I don't think it's that bad. If you put a decent sized shield on your uh, cruiser or bike, it should eliminate a lot of it. Um, I think you probably get a little bit more turbulence, non-clean air. Uh, but even if you don't have a screen on here. I know whoever gets on the back of my bike, unless they're huge, I become the shield. I am the shield getting it with the wind. They're going to be just fine. Again, the air might not be as clean in that, you know, it might be a little bit of turbulence come back there, but but I think up at at least 70 miles an hour, which is what I've tested with my pillions, uh, with my passengers, they didn't complain about any kind of clean air issues or uh, turbulence or anything like that. So I feel pretty comfortable in saying at least someone my size is going to act like a shield. Now again, if you have a miniature person up front and a big berth on the back, that might be a whole different story. So the seat itself. So if you look at some of the reviews on some of these bikes, not all pillion seats have the same comfort level. As I mentioned before, one of the reasons I wanted the pillion seat to begin with was because I want to take passengers on the back and I wanted their experience to be more comfortable than it was on my sports bike. But the generic statements of the couple of reviewers I saw where the pillion said that it wasn't the most comfortable didn't provide any details, at least not enough for me to make my own independent assessment or determination of the comfort level. For example, were they using the 2018 version of the Speedmaster or were they using the post-2021? Because I think in 2021, around that time, they upgraded from their standard seats to the more plushier seats, I guess, based on customer complaints. So this contoured seat is actually part of the upgrade. They also upgraded the pillion seat um, and, the, and the cushiness of it. So was it before or after? Uh, they didn't say, and if they did, I don't remember what they said. The other thing they didn't discuss is passenger. Uh, there was no description of the passenger. Was this passenger a tall 5 foot 11 olive oil type situation, or is it more like a Henrietta Hippo situation? Because the, I see that the seat's not that wide, so I would imagine some girl with a fat ass 
would be probably be a little less comfortable on this than a thinner girl with a normal ass size. When they did this, was it strictly the pillion seat or did they have the backrest? Because again, that makes a difference between economy and the business class. You know, even if it's a plushier seat without the backrest, that means they're still hanging on to the passenger. They're still doing the head knocking. If the, if the driver or the pilot of the bike is a bad pilot, it doesn't know how to shift smoothly, uh, brake suddenly. So uh, that could alter the experience. Were they going on a smooth road? Were they going on a gravel road, a bumpy road? I mean, all these things matter as far as the experience on the pillion on the Speedmaster, in my opinion. So I knew the only way I was gonna get my answer was to test it myself. So I invoked four test dummies to help me uh, figure that out, to help me gain a better understanding of the comfort level in the back of the pillion seat. Of the four girls that were on the back of this bike, Two of them had experience with sport style bikes. One, Super Sport. The other one, Sport Tour. Uh, the other two had zero experience on motorcycles whatsoever. So as far as the comfort goes, I am happy to report that the rumors of the discomfort were greatly exaggerated and all four pillions enjoyed their experience. Here's just some of their comments. <laughs> So overall, I would say it's so much. You want me to look at the camera? Yeah, um, you can be all over YouTube. We're talking at least you know tens and tens of views. <laughs> tens and tens. <laughs> um, overall, I would say it's a lot better than previous bikes I've ridden. It's very comfortable. I love the backrest. It's probably my favorite thing. To be clear, you've only ridden your dad's Harley yes. kit, and then this thing, the yes. CBR. Yeah. CBR. Um, I don't know. There's not not many negatives to when riding that down, bike. A couple times, I just gave it some gas just mm -hmm. to, just to see how it feel when you got pressed into the back. And felt fine because no, no I had point, a backrest. <laughs> so at no point do you feel like you know. No. I've had girls in the back that I'm like, oh my god. You know, can you just not go against the mm -hmm. turn? You know. Well, that I just feel uncomfortable doing that because I don't want to mess anything up while you're driving. No, you did perfect. You did fantastic. But yeah, it was it was great. It was comfortable. I liked it. I felt safe. Cool. So what did you think? I like it. That's it? Was it comfortable? Yeah. Relaxing? Yeah. So, was it comfortable? Yes, I loved it. It was very fun. I have felt... you ever been on the back of a bike before? Nope. So, so you have no frame great. of reference. So this could have been the most uncomfortable ride and the most comfortable ride of your life. Yeah, but it was really stable. I, I could go back and... Place my hands on this or on you. And was... So when we took off and I accelerated a little bit, did you feel like because you had a backstop, you're you, you're fine, right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't feel worried that I was gonna fall off at all. Awesome. It was great. I took anybody's ass who tries to be back my bike. Super fun. Super great. Had a lot of comfortable riding time on this thing. Enjoyed it a lot. Didn't feel like I was gonna fall off. I love going fast. It, it was really fun. Now I want a bike. I do want to increase the sampling size. I want to get heavier women on there. I want to get taller women on there. I want to take them for a longer ride and see how that goes. I want to find some that have experience on these Harley bikes um, or the plush bikes or the gold wings and see what it's like for them to actually get on the Speedmaster. Although I'm going to have to think that through uh, a little bit, but I have a little bit of time because it's getting colder here in Virginia uh, right now and girls love to go on the back of the bike when it's warm. They don't like going on the back of the bike when it's cold. So I'll probably have to wait till spring to expand the sampling and I'll have to think through how I'm going to do that. I can't exactly just walk into a bar and say, hey, can I borrow you because you're fat? I'd like you to test out my seat. Um, I can't exactly walk into a biker bar, walk up to the pack leader and say, hey, can I borrow your wife to hop on the back of my bike? That's not going to fly. That's definitely a quick way to get my ass kicked if I don't do this correctly. I'm not going to get my ass kicked for a few hundred subscribers. Now we get several thousand subscribers. Okay, it might be worth the risk. <laughs> I'm messing with you. I think I can figure out a way to do this without getting my ass kicked. All right, so up until now, we have been talking primarily about the experience for the passenger. Now let's talk about the experience from the pilot's perspective or the driver's perspective. So at a high level, in general, I don't think it matters what kind of bike you're riding. You are going to feel a noticeable difference between driving solo or having a passenger on the back of your bike. There's definitely going to be a degradation performance. I mean, that's just physics from the power to weight ratio alone. There's going to be a degradation in your ability to handle the bike, to whip the bike around. Braking will be a little bit tougher. Maneuvering at slower speeds is going to be a little bit tougher. But I think the degree of difficulty between solo and two up is going to really be dependent a lot on the experience and the proficiency of the actual pilot himself. But let's start off with a sports bike and some of the characteristics of taking a passenger on the back from the pilot's perspective. One of the, I think the biggest advantages of having a girl in the back of your sports bike is because the girl's wrapped around you, there's a lot more fluidity 
in the leaning aspect of it because she's leaning with you. At least that's been my experience. So it's a little bit easier to handle the bike than other style bikes. I'd say the biggest negative about that is probably with long distances that again, especially if you're on the highway going high speeds or accelerating quickly, the girl is going to wrap you. So after a while, you're like, Ugh, you know, you'll start to feel it. it's not a big deal, but for long distances, it can, it, it can get kind of old. Now, ironically, before I got the Speedmaster, if you had asked me about the differences between riding solo with a passenger, I would have said the difference is pretty big. Now, having gone to the Cruiser, the differences between riding a sports bike solo and with a passenger are not as great as the differences riding solo or the passenger on this thing. So, one of the advantages of having uh, the passenger in the back of a sports bike and them leaning forward is the weight's more evenly distributed across uh, the bike. The center of gravity between the both of you is shifted forward. That allows for a better, I think, handling situation, um, leaning situation into turns compared to other style bikes that are out there because they, it's almost like you are one big massive unit as far as the center of mass goes over the bike. Probably makes it a little bit easier for slightly more aggressive driving if you want to think about it that way. And just a quick data point, there are times where things just pop out in the middle of the road, a deer or something, you're trying to avoid something, you have to brake suddenly, there will be helmet clanking. I can almost guarantee it. You could be the world's greatest track racer. You get on the street, there's going to be unexpected crap where you're going to have to stop suddenly. Bam, helmet's going to collide. Here's our chart I pulled off the internet. I'm not sure about the accuracy of this, but it'll give you just a general idea of the positioning of the center mass of these bikes before a rider actually gets on. And you'll see that on the sports bikes, they're a little bit uh, further up and higher. Um, on the cruisers, a little bit lower and further back as far as the center mass goes. So there are the advantages of a more distributed weight center mass, but keep in mind because sports bikes already have a higher center mass and you're sitting up higher to begin with and the pillion's up even higher, you are really lifting that center mass pretty high. So from the axle of the wheel perspective, the back wheel, uh, you're going to have two tendencies. One, you're going to have a tendency to want to lift the bike on the back if you're both leaning back, especially if she grabs onto your shoulders. We'll talk about that later. And if you have to brake suddenly, emergency braking, there is the tendency for the bike to want to flip. You know, so you have both extremes when you have a high center of mass. Having said that, overall when you're moving, when you're not doing extreme braking or accelerating, I think you have a better situation as far as the center of gravity and the weight distribution over the two tires. So as a general rule of thumb, I would say if you're an inexperienced driver and you don't know what you're doing, as counterintuitive as it sounds, you might be better off taking that girl on a sports bike It'll be easier for you. It might be miserable for her, but it'll probably be easier for you. All right, quick little tangent. Let's talk about sex. Not the birds or the bees. I'm talking about having guys on the back of the bike. I don't have a whole lot of experience with that. I think in my youth I did it a couple times. They were more like emergency situations, get from point A to point B. I don't think I ever took a male on the back of a bike for a joy ride. But as a general rule of thumb here in the U.S., guys don't put guys on the back of bikes. Riding on the back of another man's motorcycle can be a dangerous threat to one's manhood, commonly known as riding bitch. Here we have our two candidates, Jimmy and Jose. Jose will be taking the rear, or bitch position. Jimmy will be our rider. How to ride bitch. Here's a few quick tips. Never look your rider in the eye. Leave a good 10 centimeter gap between rider's back and passenger's balls. And most definitely, do not massage the rider. I think there's a stereotype, maybe it's true, that the U.S. males might be a little bit more homophobic than our European counterparts. I don't know. I'm just going by stereotypes. And maybe homophobic isn't the right word. Not that uh, American males have issues with homosexuals. You know, they can do whatever they want, you know, to each their own, not a problem. But if you are a hetero, you might not want that balls-to-butt positioning, you know what I'm saying? And I'm sure it doesn't help that the Americans call this back seat the bitch seat. I feel really safe with you. I noticed that. And if you ever lay your head on my back again when you're riding, bitch, I'll throw you in the traffic. I think it's important to acknowledge that when the situation is awkward with another guy on the back of the bike, it becomes a little bit more dangerous to ride two up. Why? A few reasons. One, the guy tends to pull back further. The minute you start sliding someone back, it's throwing off the center mass. It's adding more weight to the back. It increases the likelihood of you doing an unplanned wheelie uh, because guys are hesitant to hug other guys. They might grab their shoulders, they grab their shoulders, rips the guy back, guys holding the throttle. I mean, I've seen that kind of crap happen and it happens a lot when a guy tries to get on the back of a bike with another guy. I don't see that kind of crap happening with females on the back very often. If a female gets on the back and that's kind of assuming what is happening here, you know, there's no issue. A guy gets on the back of the bike, things become awkward. And when things become awkward, they can become dangerous. I'm not advocating this. I'm just acknowledging that this might be an issue if you have a guy on the back. 
So again, just keep that in mind. If you ever take a guy on the back of the bike, unless that guy feels comfortable wrapping you and you feel comfortable having that guy wrap you, it could turn into an ugly situation. Hey man, I've never ridden this before, but I kind of love it. That gives me a sense of relief. I didn't know if you'd be okay with riding this. Oh. Woo! Yeah! So when I took my first test dummy out, I was driving through Old Town Leesburg, you know, I'd say 20, five miles an hour, I think is the speed limit. We weren't going very, very fast. And we were going down, we had just come up over this hill, we're going down another hill. I was gonna make a right turn. As soon as I pulled in there, I saw that there was all kinds of construction, the road was beat up. I'm like, nah, not, not doing this. I had not changed the preload, so I knew it was gonna be a bumpy ride, or I feared it was gonna be a bumpy ride. Either way, I figured I'd avoid it. So I go to whip my bike back into the middle of the street, and that's when I realized, holy crap, the ability to flick that bike, much, much different than on a, on a sports bike. It definitely felt like it was much tougher, moving like molasses to get that bike back into the street. So here is my first passenger, and um, she has been on the back of my VFR many, many, many times, years and years ago. I think we hit somewhere around 130 to 140 on the back. Because we were going so fast, you know, she was tucked in, her helmet was in my back, I don't think she realized any difference between 90 and 130 other than maybe the sound of the engine. Because for her, it's just a matter of just hanging on and feeling the wind blow right by. So she's always been accustomed to wrapping me. Well, she hopped on this thing, and I remember as we were driving, I'm like, damn, I mean, I could really feel her, every movement she's making. I'm like, you know, I was thinking in the back of my head, what is she doing back there? It wasn't later until I got home and I was checking out the video on the Insta360 that I realized she's back there fidgeting with her phone and so relaxed. I mean, she's not used to that. She's just leaning back and she's like filming with her phone. I'm like, okay, but in doing so, she's shifting all over the place. Now, um, in her defense, I didn't give her any instructions. I didn't tell her don't shift. I didn't tell her to do anything. I kind of wanted to see what it felt like and how it feel and what she'd do. And this is what she did. So not a big deal other than I can tell you that I felt it much greater than I would have been on a sports bike. Actually, on a sports bike, she wouldn't have been doing that, right? She would have just been hanging on. She doesn't know what I'm gonna take off, so she's ready to grab. On this thing, again, they can relax, they can chill. Now, again, this happened at pretty slow speeds. I think we were slowing down to around 15 miles an hour, something like that, when that happened. If you're going 30, 40 miles an hour, okay, now you get into the bike's natural stabilization. It becomes much easier. The shifting around back there, if she were to shift around, you'll feel it less if you feel it at all. This is really at slower speeds, you gotta worry about that kind of stuff, I think. I guess if you're actually cornering aggressively, it could be an issue. But again, on the Speedmaster, you shouldn't be cornering aggressively. And you can only corner so aggressively before you bottom out the pegs. And I've already bottomed out the pegs several times. So this is where the Speedmaster Cruiser might actually be lacking compared to other cruisers. If you remember from my first video, there's certain things I wanted. I wanted a shorter rake angle. I wanted a lighter weight bike so I can flick it around. Well, this is where that stabilization helps, right? <laughs> if you have a longer rake angle on this thing, a more shallow rake angle, the bike is more stable which means it is harder to move from side to side and to handle from side to side. But in keeping in a straight line, it becomes much easier. I'm sure you've seen the people just kick back, relax. Bikes almost drive themselves in a straight line. That makes it harder to turn, but easier to carry somebody in a straight line. Not to mention when you have some of those bikes, let's just say hypothetically the 800 you know, pound bikes, the 900 pound bikes that are out there, their center of mass, and let's just say you're only adding you know, 250 pounds or 200 pounds, let's use round numbers. So that's eight to 200. So of the thousand pounds, the center of mass will probably only shift up like 20% of the distance between the two center masses. Um, it's actually pretty linear and proportional how that, that works, uh, but it is 3D spatial. So uh, again, I got my engineering mind going again, but either way, uh, those bikes will probably do better as far as the difference that you feel won't be as great on a heavier bike because the loaded weight is much, much smaller in proportion to the total weight of the bike or the setup overall. And when you have your passenger in the back with all that room shifting around, I think that's where you have the advantage of having those longer rank angles on some of those heavier cruisers. But again, it's not that big of a deal. If you're an experienced rider, uh, you should be able to handle it. If you can't handle it, you can talk to the passenger and say, hey, can you stop shifting? You know. Uh, so it's not really that, that big of a deal, but it actually works to your advantage as well in that if you don't want to be wrapped, if you don't want to be hugged, if you want to be able to sit back and lean back and not have somebody wrapped all over you, this Speedmaster allows you to do it. Now, they can always slide up if you, you know, if you want that kind of romantic feeling. The female can always slide up and wrap you. That's not an issue. But at the same time, the female's got an option to slide back and give you some space as well. So you can have the best of both worlds on the Speedmaster. Now, having said that, the torque on this thing, because it's so good, that low end torque, I think it helps out quite a bit when you have a passenger on there. At least, again, at slower speeds and takeoff, it's nice to have that kind of access to that much torque low in the rev range. I've never ridden a 250cc bike. I'm not sure how it would do with a passenger on the back. 
I'm not sure if you'd struggle to go up a mountain or go up a hill, uh, what the acceleration would be. I've just never done that. I would imagine, though, that the power to rate ratio is not in your favor when you're dealing with a 250 or 300 or whatever the small bikes are that you take at the MSF class. Can't imagine that would do very well with a pillion on the back, especially if it's a bigger pillion. So to sum up this section, I definitely think Speedmaster is probably a little bit harder for an inexperienced driver. You probably want to be an intermediate driver before you attempt to take a pillion on the back of the Speedmaster Cruiser, where the sports bike, I think, is probably the easiest for a beginner driver driving passengers. Just to highlight some of the takeaways from what I just went over, I think the Speedmaster is great for the pillions. An experienced rider should have absolutely no problem. If you're not an experienced rider, still great for the pillion, it might be a little bit harder for you. All things being equal, I think the sport bike might be easier for a beginner. So I think the difficulty that one might have on this would have to do with their experience and their skill set, the proficiency at taking pillions in general, and being able to adapt to the added weight, the shifting of the center of mass. If the pillion shifts around in the back, are you going to have issues? Are you experienced enough to counter for that? Or is it going to throw you off or you end up in a ditch? That's where the experience matters. The pillion, what kind of pillion are you dealing with? Are you dealing with Henrietta Hippo? Are you, do you have a 400 pounder on there or do you have a 100 pounder on there? That will matter. What are the roads that you're taking? Are these populated urban streets where there are crazy ass drivers looking to cut you off and run you over? Or are you just hitting the highway on a country road and just going straight for 100 miles? Which again, I know it can be taxing, but that's not exactly something that requires a mastery of motorcycles to be able to do. Anybody can go in a straight line. And I was actually gonna bring up some other things, but I completely botched the video. In this video dealing with pillions and the Speedmaster and cruisers and bikes and sports bikes, I was going to have a couple more sections. One was the suspension. We we're going to talk about the points of suspension. Then I was actually going to illustrate on the Speedmaster uh, the preload. Talk about the points of preload, how to adjust it, why you want to adjust it, and some of the issues with the Speedmaster and its rear suspension in the monoshock. And then I was going to close it out with what I would characterize as practical safety tips for riding two up. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because I actually started watching some other YouTube videos. Like I said, I'm not a big YouTube kind of guy, ironically, since I'm posting my videos on YouTube. But I figured, you know, let me see what's, what's out there. And the more I looked at some of these videos, I was like, what the hell? What, what, what am I looking at? Some of the absolute statements they were making that was specific to their size or their bike or their style of riding, they made generically as an absolute best practice across all platforms. And it, it's just absurd. So I wanted to give you kind of a different perspective um, and one that I did not see out there. And that would be safety tips related to giving ad hoc ride to total strangers. I mean, it's one thing to have a devoted spouse, you know, for 20 years, she's going to go riding with you. Yeah, get the best gear, get all that stuff. But what about the person who came over and said, hey, can you take me for a ride? If, if you listen to a lot of these instructors, the answer is no, absolutely not. No, I haven't had a classroom session with you. You don't have a full, you don't have full protector gear. Where's your leather onesie? Uh, no, you're, you're not qualified. Okay. Are you crazy? Is that your problem? But let's just say you don't subscribe to that line of thinking and you do want to take a girl for a ride and you want to do it safely. Those are the kind of tips I was actually going to help you out with or at least try to give you my perspective on it to make sure you don't do anything stupid and you maximize your enjoyment. So anyway, there are, this, is, this was again all going to be discussed um, originally in this video, but now this is going to have to go into part two. Like I said, I'm going to beat a dead horse here. I don't do this for a living, don't have sponsors, kind of do it on my own. You can tell by all the professionalism. So, you know, hit subscribe. That's the only way I know people are interested. And um, again, the more subscribers I see, the more likely I'm willing to continue these things, maybe explore deeper, push a little further. So the other video that I was working on, I'm either going to deploy before or after I finish part two of this, because I'm almost done with part two of this. It's just, uh, I, I actually, when I get the footage, I need to get a different camera angle so you can actually see me adjusting. You don't have to see me. I guess I could walk you through it, but I'd rather just show you how to adjust the preload on this thing and how easy it is. But anyway, like I was saying, the other video will deal with being a tall rider on the Speedmaster. And cruisers, things you should look for. Again, like I said, I'm new to YouTube, so I started looking around there, and I started seeing all these tests that they have, you know, where basically they're saying, hey, you're a schmuck if you can't do a U-turn in 20 feet or whatever it is. So, never done this in my life. I said, screw it, I'm gonna go to a parking lot. I just wanna see, you know, so what, what is the turning radius on this thing? What is my braking compared to other people's braking? So anyway, um, I capture that all on film. That's going to go into the tall person riding the Speedmaster uh, video. So again, if that's something you'd like to see, hit subscribe. Um, if there's something you think that I can help you with or something that you'd like to see or some area where you think people might be withholding their honest opinion because they have a conflict of interest because they're sponsored by somebody, let me know. If I don't know the answer, I'll let you know. If I think I can tell you where to find it or find it for you, depending on my time, I'll let you know. 
but you know, it can't hurt to ask. Worst case scenario, I just laugh at you, right? So feel free to ask. I never fault people for asking. And lastly, I'll just leave you with, when I first started doing this, I was not thinking that I'd have so many international viewers. I mean, yeah, it's YouTube, but you know, when I started getting comments from Australia and New Zealand and Germany and Britain, I was flattered, I'll be honest. I, again, I was kind of thinking people in the US would be watching this. Anyway, I hope you like these videos. I hope they're a little bit different, different enough to actually take a little bit of interest, hear some counter arguments to some of the prevailing wisdom that's out there. Again, I'll try to defend my arguments with facts, data, experiences. I'll try to be exact in my language as to whether I'm stating an opinion or stating fact. So I'm going to wrap this thing up because my Redskins are getting ready to play here shortly, and I hope to God they win today. Peace out from Virginia.